morning. My name is Palmer Nyhaus. I am, uh, was involved with Austin Pets Alive in the beginning in 2008 uh, when Ellen Jefferson stepped in and relaunched it. And at that point, we launched the dog rescue program, dog foster program, and uh, kind of APA was reborn. And what we're going to talk about this morning is rescuing dogs uh, at risk of unnecessary euthanasia or dogs that are you know, slated to be killed uh, at your shelters. At the end, we'll have time for questions. So if you can keep questions till the end, uh, that would be great so we can move through it. We're going to start off with a video that was actually filmed of our rescue team in the Austin shelters early on, probably 2000, late 2008 or early 2009. It was filmed by a volunteer that also um, makes videos and short stories, and it's a little bit of a story about uh, the dilemma we were faced with daily about not being able to save every animal that we wanted to. Dallas or Houston, they tell you leave your animals at home. Here you can go to restaurants, coffee houses, Hotel. stores. Hotel. Yeah. Yeah, I take them shopping at the Neiman Marcus. Everybody knows them. Yeah. You Usually take, they say no take them dog. To a oh, good girl. Austin is the most dog-friendly city and area I've ever been in, and I very much appreciate it. Fish is a good dog. That all they do. Just give love. That's it. They they live for you to come home. There's a ton of dog parks in Austin. Me and my friend were just like looking up a list. There's like 20 of them. Hey, come here. In 1998, there was a proposal to make Austin a no-kill city for homeless animals. Obviously, that hasn't happened, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. A no-kill city, that means that the only animals that are being put to sleep are the ones that truly need it. So the ones that are um, extremely aggressive to people or danger to the community or the ones that are suffering and are terminally ill. But currently in Austin, we are still killing healthy and adoptable pets, and that's something that we want to see ended. I'm Ellen Jefferson, and I'm the president and veterinarian for Austin Pets Alive. Austin Pets Alive's rescue program is targeting animals that are at Town Lake Animal Center. Every day at 5 p.m., we go in and look at the animals that are slated for euthanasia for the next morning, and we take the ones that we think we can find homes for easily. The dogs here at our South Congress location are all dogs that we pulled from the euthanasia list at Town Lake Animal Center, and all of them would have been euthanized within 12 hours of when we met them, and we were able to pull them out and save them and hopefully find some good homes for them. Hi, I'm Sharon Nichols, and I work here at the Town Lake Animal Center. We're the only open intake facility in Austin and Travis County, so we take any animals at all times. 
Queenie and Rhino were dropped off here in an overnight kennel. So they were safe and sound in their night kennel, and we came in in the morning and found out that they had been here before, twice before, and reclaimed by their owners both times. So we've called and left them messages for the last three days. We haven't heard back at all from them. Austin Pets Alive is um, saying we may have interest, so don't do anything. Like, don't euthanize. If we can't get a hold of the owners, don't euthanize. Let us know so we can um, try and uh, place him, or at least foster him for their adoption program. Um, Queenie had an application on her in October. We're going to call that person to see if they're still interested. We want dogs to get back home, but if people don't come for them, you know, we can't hold them forever. I'm Katherine Sharp. I'm the rescue coordinator for Town Lake Animal Center. I work with all the rescue organizations, um, over 80 of them, that help us to move animals out of here alive. The first thing I do when I come in, or try to do, is look at all the animals that have come in the previous day and identify which animals I think are appropriate or good candidates for our rescue partners. And that way I can go ahead and get notes on them ahead of time. That way if I'm out, someone can see that note and say, yeah, this looks like a good candidate for Great Dane Rescue or Blue Dog or Lucky Mutts. I look uh, primarily at breed. Pure breeds we always try to find something for, but I also look at anything that looks adoptable out there that I think we can fit into the program. I'll put some kind of a note on saying, please, if not picked for adoption or reclaimed, please put in, consider for the rescue program. My feeling about animal homelessness in Austin, in the, in the world, is spay and neuter is very important and we've made incredible strides in that direction, but until we can get down the lifetime commitment part of the equation to folks, we're not winning this battle. When you bring that cute fluffy kitten in your house, that's a 20 year commitment. If you take care of that cat, it should live 20 years. This dog should live to be 15. This is not a purse. This is a little dog who was, you know, up until two, day, two or three days ago was living in a home with that was, you know, may not have been the best home, but it was her home with another dog, and now she's here by herself in a big scary kennel. And um, I don't know what's gonna happen to her. Behind me is the, uh, is a vintage trailer that Austin Pets Alive put together for saving orphan puppies and kittens. Currently, any motherless babies that are brought into the shelter are euthanized because they're not able to be fed by staff. The city doesn't have the resources to feed them and care for them. So we pull them out and we bring them here and we have volunteers that feed them throughout the day and night and get them up to a point where they're adoptable. First thing we do is weigh them. Keep a real careful track of their weight. Come on, sit still. Okay. Ideally two to three hours. So that means we either have to have staff during the night or someone takes them home. There are, there are a number of people who are willing to take them home. It means they don't sleep that night. It takes an hour and a half to feed the, uh, 11 kittens. There are three major bottlenecks that are in the way of making it possible for animals to get more animals to get out alive. And one of them is the behavior test, which is a, um, a test that needs to be done on any adult dog over six months old. And basically it's an exam to make sure that they are safe for the public to adopt. And then there is also a medical workup, and that usually involves two to three stages where they're heartworm tested um, for dogs, feline leukemia tested for cats. Uh, vaccinated, microchipped, and then spayed and neutered. The third is the adoption processing, um, which is actually a person processing the paperwork and the application for a, an adopter who might want to be interested in the animal. The main reason animals are euthanized at our shelter is because of a lack of space. And the truth is we have enough space, it's just we have a lack of efficiency to get them out. And so that's a very critical uh, point because if we could just move them out faster, then we would have all the space we need and we could save them all.
My name is Kim Boren, and I'm with Austin Pets Alive. The rescue team comes to Town Lake Animal Center every day, and we are the only rescue group that gets the euthanasia list for both dogs and cats, and we try to save as many as we can. And a lot of it depends on um, how full we are, and then it's just a trying to decide what we feel that we can get adopted. Tomorrow they will be, before the shelter opens to the public, they will be put down. Sit, sit, sit. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's a good boy. Hi, hi, can you sit? Sit. Sit. Come on. Sit. Good boy. Good boy. Yes. Good boy. This is a dog that's owner surrender. And there's also a note on here to say, keep the towel and the toy with the dog. So the owner must care about it. Um, and I want to find out if the owner knows that it's going to be called tomorrow. I know it. I know it, sweetie. Here we go. This is an owner surrender because they couldn't take care of her anymore. And she's on youth for aggression. She's a little chunky. <laughs> she needs to be put on a diet. But this is a dog that was on Youth for Aggression. Hi, sweetheart. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Hi, sweetie. Oh, my. Well, come here. What a good girl. You brought in five dogs? Kim worked to maintain proper care for them. She likes to roam and herd the other pet. You got a green light at first, um, and then a yellow light from the vaccinator due to his size and strength. It was very jumpy and kind of knocking over. <laughs> uh, gave us the owner's address, owner has no transportation, and a phone number. Um, and supposedly has no running water or electricity, so we, we didn't do a utility search. Okay. I know you're doing great stuff, but how do you do it? And like, it sucks. <laughs> you know, I have to. I have to think about it all the time, but then I, you know, I also every day I see. Happy feeling. Yeah. You know, so. That's well. We do. <laughs> and then we go on vacation. <laughs> and you can imagine, I have a lot of people asking me how I can do this. And it's hard, but you have to think of the positive and you have to right. think of the ones that you can save and that you're doing, you're doing some good. Yeah. So. And when we get, you know, numbers back, like statistics and finding out, you know, how much less we're euthanizing than we used to, it's, that's also very, you know, makes you feel good. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you, AP. <laughs> <laughs> so, yay. It's hard, but we do it. Because somebody's got to. And, I, and we realize it's hard for you. And yeah, we, you we, are very, we are very appreciative of the work that you all do here. And we tell people that. I know you do. APA saved two dogs today. Um, Dee Dee, who is a little fat chihuahua and was just precious. 
and she is just a roly-poly. And then we also took out uh, Dozer, who is a boxer mix. Dee Dee and Dozer were both on the list, and there were 12 animals, 12 dogs total on the list. And we were able to save two. The others, the other 10 on the list, will be killed tomorrow morning. It's been very, very rare that we have actually seen true aggressive animals. Most of them are terrified and they just want out. They're confused. They don't understand why this is happening to them. Um, the animals that are killed here are injected, injected with a lethal injection. Their bodies are dumped in a landfill. So there are just mountains of carcasses in our landfills. You know, you heard the parable about the starfish, about the kid throwing the starfish. He's throwing the starfish back in the oceans, and there's thousands, millions of them on the, on the beach, and the man walks up behind him and says, oh, well, don't cry. It makes no difference. He says it does to this one. So it does. It makes a difference, too. Never get enough of those. That's a good girl. I know. I know. It'll be okay. We'll find something for you. Rhino was actually transferred to Austin Pets Alive on the 13th. Queenie, let's see what's going on. euthanized. She was euthanized on the 13th. There has been another proposal to come up to come up to the city council proposing that Austin become a no-kill city um, and this is for 2009. We're very hopeful that this will come to fruition and I think we have a very caring community. And if people really realized what was going on, they would want to put a stop to it. And that's why Austinites need to be vocal about making Austin a no-kill city, because these animals don't deserve this. And Austin's better than this. able to man uh, having someone from Austin Pets Alive at the city shelter 365 days a year uh, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, because that was the only time available that we had to evaluate the animals at risk, make a decision, and set to get them out. Let me get the... Okay, so rescuing dogs at risk of unnecessary euthanasia. Back in 2008, when we were forming the Dog Rescue Department for Austin Pets Alive, our main thoughts were we wanted to focus only on the dogs with no other options to leave the shelter alive. If in the process of saving one of the dogs, another option became available, say another rescue group, an adopter, a previous owner, we always deferred and let them take the dog, even if we were near the end of our process for pulling the dog. Because if someone else wanted to save the dog, it gave us an option to save another, and there was no guarantee that that person would then choose to save another. That picture is Christopher. Um, Christopher was an early Austin Pets Alive save, and we, for many, many months, had no idea what type of dog he was. He turned out to be a golden retriever mix puppy, just severe mange, and uh, recovered beautifully uh, as adopters treated him and brought him back to visit us months later. 
Next goal was identifying who was at risk. One of the first challenges to, was to figure it out. We learned that that group consisted of animals that the shelter had deemed unadoptable and had placed on their risk list. The other rescue groups had declined to save them and owner reclaim options had been exhausted. Following these guidelines, it allowed us to be sure that the lives we saved, saved were ones that would have been lost. It was very easy to track our direct impact on the shelter's euthanasia rate since every dog we saved would have been euthanized. And ultimately, more lives were saved through no duplication of effort. We could not guarantee if we saved one, someone else would save another. First steps. We had to identify our rescue capabilities and opportunities. We identified two types of rescues that we could save lives. The first type was traditional rescue, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, taking the animal into our program. The second type of rescue we identified was what we called alternative rescue. This was seeking adoption, reclaim, or another rescue saved directly from the shelter. So the animal never entered the Austin Pets Alive program. We would market it while it was at the shelter. We would contact other rescue groups. We would contact previous owners. Taking the rescues into our program. We had to set some guidelines for which the program functioned. Number one was capacity. We had to set capacity numbers of animals and the criteria of those that we could save. We had to address our resources of like how many foster homes do we have available? What types and ages are they willing to take? What types of medical and or behavioral problems can we accommodate? We also had to address our adoption capabilities. How many animals are we capable of adopting out on a monthly basis? Do we have off-site events? How many, how often? Do you market the dogs online and adopt them out directly out of foster homes? We came up with what we call the golden rule. Our intake numbers needed to match adoption numbers closely so we didn't get ahead of ourselves. As your adoption program grows, so will your ability to save more animals. The alternative rescue. One of the means we used was shelter reconsideration. If the shelter had signed off on an animal and put it on a euthanasia list, and we saw something that we thought they missed, or we saw an improvement that we thought they had not yet seen uh, through interaction with the animal, we would often ask the shelter to reconsider or reevaluate the animal and see if they would reconsider their decision. And often it was successful. Uh, we were careful when we asked uh, to make sure that we didn't think they were wasting their time and that they realized when we asked them to, to, to reconsider, um, they were probably going to see something that, that hadn't been seen before. The second was owner or source reclaim. Even when someone owner surrendered a dog, we didn't know what conversation took place at the front desk. We didn't know how clearly it was explained that the owner could be euthanized. We would often call the owner or even the person that found the dog and brought it to the shelter and explain to them the predicament the dog was in. Often finding that an owner may be able to contact family member or some other option or source. It was quite often neither of the people whether it was an owner or a civilian bringing in as a stray, really thought that that would happen to this dog, that euthanasia was a possibility. So we were able to get a lot of them uh, picked back up by owners or by the person that found it, and they would try to find a home on their own. We would also reach out to or ask the shelter to reach out to other rescue groups. Often when we had the dogs and we were evaluating them, we might notice a, you know, a uh, strong ball drive or something that might work for one of the uh, rescue groups that has an activity related um, type of dog that they're looking for. We'd reach out to rescue groups that were breed specific, uh, often had good success with them coming down. Another way we would do it, we would market the dog while it was in the shelter, posting pictures, bios, videos on Facebook and Craigslist to try and find an adopter or its owner to save it directly from the shelter. 
We also would talk to the public whenever we were out working with the animals or handling them. Someone walked by us, inquired, or looked in the kennel. We would always try to engage the public and introduce them to the animals that we were working with. We would review the shelter notes for interested parties. Often digging through the notes, we would find notes that you know, someone came in and asked about the animal or there was an adoption application uh, that, that was a backup that fell off because the dog was adopted to someone else. Reading the notes carefully, we often found that there was someone listed on there that we thought might be worth a reach out and often had luck um, trying to get them to come down when they realized the dog's fate. Working the alternative rescue program saved on average 30 animals per month at no cost to Austin Pets Alive. It did not affect the number that we were pulling into our program because it didn't compete for off-site adoptions or foster homes. So it was a phenomenal way to try to help save the animals uh, without using our resources that we were using on the ones we were pulling. Working with the shelter where you'll be saving lives. This can, this can take some time to forge a relationship. What we would suggest is scheduling a meeting to discuss what your group will be doing and how you can work together. Meeting topics. How can you identify dogs at risk on a daily basis? Do they have a report that they can provide to you? If so, you need to find out when it's available and how long you'll have to make a decision. What information will be provided? Medical, behavioral, owner surrender notes. Do they vaccinate for distemper and parvo on intake? And if not, that's something that really needs to be addressed and visited about is encouragement for them to change their shelter practice to vaccinate on intake. Will they allow your rescue team access to these animals for evaluations? What medical work will be done? Can any basic or additional med medical workup be prepared or provided before the animal leaves the shelter? How can you assure the ones you are working to save are safe from being euthanized while you figure out placement? A lot of times the shelter's euthanizing when they're closed. You want to make sure that you have a clear, concise way to guarantee that animal you've asked for there to be a hold on, you're seeking foster for, or you have someone interested in adopting, is safe that next morning while they're closed. If you identify one you can save, how long do you have to coordinate getting it out of the shelter and finding foster, and how will you notify them of ones you are working on saving? And then lastly, how will you receive a copy of the records for the animals you do save? Forming your rescue team. We had position of manager, evaluators, and then additional support. The manager oversees the program, decides who will enter the program, must be level-headed, practical, and focused on the big picture, and sustainability so you do not get ahead of your resources. Must adhere to the golden rule, needs to clearly understand that your intake numbers need to match your adoption numbers closely so you don't get ahead of yourself with financial resources or physical resources. The choices of those you do pull need to be adopted quickly so you can save more. They must have an understanding of adoptability of the animals in order to prioritize who is saved and in what order. The quicker they are adopted, the quicker their spot can be used to save another. They train and create the protocols for volunteers and oversee that the relationship between the rescue team and the shelter is a positive one, even in difficult times. Must be conscious of the rescue team members' emotions, Walking the shelter daily and seeing all the dogs chosen for euthanasia and having to make difficult decisions of who you can save based on your capacity is very emotional. Evaluators. They evaluate the at-risk animals. Hands-on at the shelter, looking and evaluating animals at risk of being euthanized. 
In the beginning, as you're saving the easier to adopt animals, the handling knowledge level there can be fairly basic. As you move on to save dogs with some issues, whether training or behavioral, the level of handling knowledge will need to be greater. But hopefully, your evaluate, evaluators will continue to learn and their ability increase at the same time. The evaluators have a very difficult job of meeting the animals at risk and realizing they cannot all be saved. They will have to try and remain focused on the fact that you are saving who you can today and hope that the number you can save increases. And if it wasn't for them going and doing that tough job that day, no one would be getting saved. Must be dependable and compassionate. If it's their turn to evaluate and they cannot make it, it's possible that none of the dogs will get out. Additional support and alternative rescue. We took volunteers that wanted to make videos, photographs, that were good at marketing, posting at-risk animals on social media, Craigslist, Facebook, administrative, helping with paperwork, carrying clipboard, writing notes. If anybody wanted to volunteer with the rescue team, we took them. It's a tough job. It's a very tough job to find someone that's comfortable walking down there and seeing all those animals on a daily basis. And if you find someone that wants to help, find a way to engage them. You'd be surprised on what may turn into. If they started off helping with notes, they may turn out to be one of your best evaluators as they get comfortable with the routine down there. The communication between the rescue team and shelter, very important uh, to establish a line of communication on who is authorized to place an animal on hold for your group, who is authorized to confirm that your group will take an animal, who's authorized to pick one up, and who do they contact if they have questions. We ran into early on, um, you know, people, volunteers getting overzealous, calling and saying they'd take an animal or someone would pick one up. We wouldn't know who would have it, or it made sense very early to establish a clear set of numbers and contacts with the city on how that would unfold and what they could expect from you as far as clarification on who you're taking. Key lines of communication between the rescue team, public, volunteers for your group, and volunteers and staff at the shelter. The rescue team is always dealing with life and death. Everything is time sensitive and often highly emotional. It is important to make sure nothing falls between the cracks since miscommunication or delayed communication could be the difference between life and death. For this reason, it's extremely important that everything be funneled back through the rescue manager. The rescue team's evaluations and thoughts, the shelter staff questions and information, volunteer and shelter volunteer questions and concerns, and the public questions and concerns. Requests to save certain animals start coming in from all directions. Whoever is asking will keep asking different members of your team and group trying to get the answer they are wanting. For this reason, all requests need to be funneled back to the rescue manager to make sure that the answers and decisions are consistent. We often found that if someone is pushing hard for you to save an animal, they're often talking to and pushing multiple people and groups at the same time and often will find a live outcome for that animal without you. Since you're trying hard to save many animals without someone fighting for them, it's often best to let the person keep fighting. Keep fighting and looking for placement other than with your group. So if they find another way out to save the animal, you can save another. It's not saying we wouldn't help that person, but we'd usually be slow to respond in the hopes that maybe they might find another way. Obstacles we encountered in the beginning. In the beginning, it took us some time to get a true list, euthanasia list. At first, they gave us a list that was uh, chosen dogs they wanted to work rescue on. When we got that first report and read through it, and it was a bunch of small breeds, Lhasa Apsas, Chihuahuas, and we turned around and took a look and said, this is not the list that we're asking for. We're asking for the list that's going to be euthanized in the morning. 
We had to push. It took, it took multiple days and multiple meetings for them to finally give us the list which they would be working off of the next morning. Working with the shelter management that does not always embrace the change. Staying positive and professional while working with those that do not agree with no kill. Learning to deal with our emotions that although we wanted to save them all, we had limitations and were not capable of doing so yet. Learning to cope with our limitations of adoption venues, foster homes, medical funding, while those programs grew with us. Typical day of the rescue team started with evaluating notes for the dogs at risk of euthanasia. At risk list is received from the shelter at 5 p.m. Evaluators are there from 5 to 7 looking at the dogs at risk. They had two hours to evaluate every animal, review the notes, put holds on them, and make decisions how they were going to be saving them. On a dog evaluation, a couple of the things they look at is approach. How do they do being approached in the kennel? Can they be easily leashed and walked to a play yard? Did they react to other dogs while walking in the play yard? Can they be easily handled? Can they be comfortably restrained? Do they know any commands? Are there any health concerns seen or noted by shelter or previous owners? Any behavioral concerns seen or noted by shelter or previous owner? Take a picture so it can be shared with the adoption team or, or alternative placement team that will be handling Craigslist or Facebook. The rescue manager shares the results with their manager. Manager decisions. It's based on space limitations, capabilities, adoptability, and alternative options. Adoptability. Who will get adopted the quickest so another life can be saved? What resources do you have for medical and behavioral Identify the types you can most easily adopt out. Puppies, young dogs, small breeds, large breeds without me medical or behavioral concerns, unique breeds or colors, good with other animals, temperaments most me easily adopted. Can the average person handle them? Are they safe for a child to handle? Are they good with other dogs and cats? And are they doing well in the stressful shelter environment? Notification, we completed a sheet Main thing to point out on this is when we took an animal off the euthanasia list, we asked them to reprint the euthanasia list for us so we could see that it had been removed properly. It did happen a few times that whoever was doing the data entry did not complete uh, the entry that removed the animal from the list and the animal was euthanized the next day. So we developed the habit of ask them to print you a clean list before you walk away that shows your animal is gone. Daily summaries and updates. Um, basically, the manager then coordinates with the foster team, transport team, and medical team, and alternative placement team on what the decisions were made, where they needed foster, where they needed transport, and who was heading to the medical clinic. Lessons learned. Small dog protocol, recognizing your evaluator's strengths and weaknesses. Things are not always what they appear. Trainers and behaviorists often willing to help independent medical reviews and engage shelter staff. Small dog protocol, we realized a lot of the dogs like Dee Dee that you saw in the video, they would on first approach by the shelter be deemed aggressive. They're scared, they're terrified, it's loud, it's noisy. We quickly learned if a dog was stressed, a small dog was stressed, not to try to evaluate it on day one. Simply try to hold it tight, hug it, so you feel it exhale and lick its lips, put it down and walk away. We found 95% of the time, the second you set that dog down, it was a different dog. All you had to do was let it process, feel safe. A couple of them, we'd have to come back the next day and do the same process again, but the vast majority of small dogs flipped within a minute to 24 hours, going from a terrified shaking to Dee Dee climbing your lap and everything was fine. Strengths and weaknesses. It's funny that Kim was the one evaluating Dee Dee. Part of the strengths and weaknesses we had to get to, some of our volunteers were big dog people, some were small dog people. And for example, when, when Kim was evaluating Dee Dee, it would have, we would have joked that she's not a small dog person and even Kim could handle Dee Dee comfortably. 
Kim was a big dog person. Things are not always what they appear. Um, Happy Girl was a blonde lab that was set to be euthanized because she was acting aggressive and had trampled a few of her puppies uh, in the back of the shelter and nobody could handle her. Read the notes on Happy Girl and it turns out she was dumped in the parking lot pregnant. All of the notes when she came into the shelter were friendly, happy, great, you know, nothing of concern. She got to the back, had her babies, they had a partition on her kennel where she couldn't see over it. So whenever anybody walked by, she'd jump up and down to see who was coming and that's how she trampled two of her babies. When I went back to look at her, she was a lab. She was barking, bouncing up and down, but the tail was wagging the entire time. We opened the kennel, leashed her up, pulled her out, all her puppies, she rolled over on the floor in the front office for everybody to pet pet her belly and say hi to her babies and we walked out the door. She had been declined on by rescue groups in the shelter and everyone else because nobody stopped and read the notes. She was being a good mom. Trainers and behaviorists, we found lots that were willing to volunteer either through their time and telephone consults or actually coming to the shelter. Independent medical review, Chance was one that they said was in excruciating pain, had injuries, broken pelvis, and they, when I went to evaluate him, he was pretty um, slow from all the medication that he was on. We had our medical director review the notes, and she suspected by, from what she read it was an old injury. Got him home within two hours, the pain meds wore off and he was running around the backyard. Yes, he had a limp, but it was an old injury and it had already healed. Engaged the shelter staff. They wanted to learn what we were doing to help the small dogs. So we took them out and taught them how to hold and walk away. And so we found a lot of them started doing it on their breaks and on their lunches. Ongoing obstacles, the same as what we faced in the beginning, golden rule, growth and adapting to change, emotions, and working with the shelter. And our priorities were the golden rule, staying positive and focused, dedication and creativity of volunteers, professionalism, respect, representation of your group, and no kill, and supporting one another. We are not going to let ourselves get ahead of our capabilities and threaten our sustainability. When we started rescuing in 2008, the euthanasia rate was over 50%. Within six months, we began to place all puppies under four months. Over the next year, we were able to do the same for adult dogs under 25 pounds, bottle baby puppies, and most large adult dogs without serious behavioral or training issues. Two and a half years after we started, our shelter reached and maintained a 90% save rate, and we are saving many of the animals at risk and are continuing to work towards saving them all. Our numbers, since 2011, we've been able to expand our rescue program to assist communities outside of Austin when space allows. And questions. Thank you.